Hello? I, I think let's start. Uh, so today I will give my second lecture about uh, squeezing obtained from nonlinear optics effects. So I didn't uh, discuss much squeezing in, in the first lecture. And then entanglement. I will discuss entanglement today as well. So this is the plan. Uh, first, I will discuss squeezing uh, from scratch, meaning from nothing, meaning from vacuum, uh, squeezed vacuum and squeezed coherent light. I will discuss twin beam squeezing per, uh, separately. And then I will come to my favorite subject, which is bright squeezed vacuum. And then the second part will be devoted to entanglement, starting from the orig original EPR idea then uh, discussing some dichotomic viewpoint, uh, continuous variable entanglement, discrete variable entanglement, some Bell inequality stuff, and finally, macroscopic entanglement. So first, uh, first lecture starts now. So squeezing from scratch, from squeezed vacuum. Uh, the Hamiltonian that we derived yesterday, and actually it was derived in many, uh, in several talks, uh, tells us that uh, if we have parametric down conversion, there are photon pairs created with some probability. And uh, suppose that these pairs are created into a single mold. I said that it is a special case, the degenerate case, and then we have some interesting squeezing. Um, again, I will try to use the Heisenberg approach and start from the Heisenberg equation, which I discussed in detail yesterday. And we come, we have the only mode for this mode, we have photon creation operator, photon annihilation operator, and the equation for this operator looks like this. So it's a very simple equation, but uh, before solving it, we have to, uh, it, it's a trick, we have to define the real and imaginary part of this operator, or rather Hermitian and anti-Hermitian part, which are called quadratures, or alternatively, uh, coordinate and momentum. And uh, for these quadratures, uh, well, don't, don't mix with the uh, coordinate and momentum of a single photon, which I, I was discussing la at, last, at the last lecture. This is not the same, absolutely not the same, but has much, much in common. Uh, so for the quadratures, uh, we have now uh, simplified equations because they do not contain any conjugated part. In, in fact, quadratures are real. Quadratures are Hermitian operators corresponding to real eigenvalues. So for each quadrature, we have a very simple simple equation that we can solve. Uh, and the solutions are that the coordinate operator uh, increases in time and uh, the uh, momentum operator reduces in time, li like this. And Q, uh, Q0, P0 are the initial values. One can write Q0, P0. I, I mixed this, I think, uh, notation uh, or will mix during today's lecture, I'm afraid. Um, so what do these equations tell us? They tell us about the evolution of the system, and the evolution is in terms of operators. So this is Heisenberg approach. This is describing the evolution of the operators. Uh, again, um, what, in, uh, what observables do these operators correspond to? In fact, Q, the coordinate, quadrature corresponds to the real part of the electric field because it's the Hermitian part of the photon annihilation operator. Momentum corresponds to the imaginary part of the electric field. You know that it's very convenient to describe electric field in terms of complex variables, although real field we measure is a, is a real field. Yeah, but, but uh, it can be put into correspondence to the so-called analytic signal, uh, which is complex. So it has an amplitude and phase, and this is exactly the representation, real part and imaginary part. So we will replace the real and imaginary parts by co quadratures, and uh, then uh, the initial state of the, the, uh, of the system is given uh, by, uh, it's, it's a vacuum. As I said, we have nothing at the input. We, we're obtaining squeezing from nothing. So the initial state is vacuum, but in quantum optics, vacuum is not just a point at the origin, but it's a set of points. It's an uncertainty. Uh, it has uncertainty. It's a spread. It's a like circle. Yeah. And uh, so we, 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 should, we should see what happens when this circle undergoes the evolution described here. 
And uh, the evolution is, of course, given by hyperbolas. So you, you, you can notice that the product of Q and P is always a constant, so equal to the initial product. And then let's plot these hyperbolas. Also, we know in what direction the evolution goes, because if we know this gamma, and gamma is, uh, depends on the pump uh, field, and on chi two and on the length. So, so we, we know in principle what, what kind of variable it is. Is it positive, negative, imaginary, and so on. So for instance, for a positive gamma, the evolution will go like this. And immediately you can see that each point of this uncertainty area will undergo this, this evolution and it will spread according to this. So each point following this hyperbolas will spread and eventually will turn into something uh, elongated, like an ellipse. And this is called squeezed vacuum. So this state is what is usually called squeezed vacuum. Uh, we should take into account that the, the whole picture rotates with time, with the optical frequency. So with time, the squeezed quadrature, now you see that uh, the quadrature that uh, has smaller uncertainty is uh, momentum. But with time, the situation changes. It will be then a coordinate or something intermediate. Initially, the uncertainties of the quadratures were given by this uh, Heisenberg uncertainty relation. So in, in this uh, normalization, it will be square root of h over 2. The uncertainty, I will remind you that this is square root of the variance. Um, and then we, with time, we see that um, the, uh, what happens is that the mean values of, uh, I think, I, think uh, I, I wanted to put mean averages on both quadratures. So I was, uh, I was going to say that the mean value of each quadrature remains zero, and this was derived by uh, Gerd Lois yesterday in his lecture, but this was derived just for uh, truncated uh, state. For he, here it, it was derived from the, from the whole Hamiltonian. So uh, the mean value remains zero, but what happens is that Mm, uh, no, I think somewhere, okay, it's not written, but, but you see that the uncertainty uh, of the uh, P quadrature, of the momentum quadrature with time shrinks, and the uncertainty of Q in increases. By the way, is it clear where time comes from? <laughs> so why do I speak about time, and what is this T that I'm using? In fact, I could say that this is the time of the interaction. So what happens in the crystal, I send my, my laser, uh, my pump, and this pump has a, for instance, it's pulsed, and this pulse, du uh, pulse has a certain duration. So you can consider that this T is the interaction time and the duration of the, of the pulse. And th okay. So the question I find interesting is that, is this really a vacuum? We call it squeezed vacuum. It sits at the origin of the phase space. Is it really a vacuum? Is it, is it, uh, how many photons does it have? And the mean photon number can be calculated very easily. In fact, yesterday I, I performed a similar calculation. Having this evolution, to calculate the photon number, we have to return to the old photon creation and annihilation operators. So probably it's also possible with the quadratures, but with the a, a dagger operators, it's easier. So we, again, remember that uh, A is formed, that, uh, that Q is its Hermitian part and P is its anti-Hermitian part. So we should add these parts. And, uh, and we obtain, by doing very uh, simple algebra, that we obtain that the transformation from uh, initial uh, operators A0 and A dagger 0 to the final operator A is described by this uh, transformation, which was yesterday also discussed, and it's called Bogolubov transformation. Uh, here I have uh, two gamma instead of gamma because it's degenerate, but it's a question of uh, notations. So I can again denote it by G and call it parametric gain, so this is the evolution. And from this, you can easily, we can easily calculate the photon number. It's again the same calculation that I did yesterday. I will not write it on the blackboard because, uh, because it's the same. So I have to calculate mean value of uh, A dagger A, uh, and then I just plug this expression into here, 
and I get these, all these terms will, with uh, mean values of a dagger not a not, a dagger not, a dagger not, and so on. And uh, as I said yesterday, because we consider the state to be a vacuum state and only the operators change, uh, you, you see that uh, whenever we have this daggered operator standing on the left, or a, an operator um, without dagger standing on the right, such terms are always zero. So uh, we, we cancel this term, this term, this, and we are left with just the last term, which is, as yesterday, the anti-normally ordered expression, and it will be non-zero, so I have to use commutation relations, um, and it will give one, so we are left with this hyperbolic sine square of G. So the mean photon number at the output of this system uh, scales exponentially with this gain, with G. And the photon number can be very large. I interesting is that this system is just described by one parameter. This is the gain. This is the only parameter that describes everything because squeezing, uh, what we call quadrature squeezing, is the fact that the quadrature, as a result of this evolution, one is increased, uh, the, the uncertainty of the quadrature is increased, the other is reduced. And, and this uh, squeezing is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the mean photon number. So when you, when you have squeezing, you can immediately say from, from the value of quadrature squeezing, you can immediately say uh, how many photons uh, in the state, uh, in the squeezed vacuum there are. Um, well, just to remind that the product of the quadratures is uh, an invariant in this system, so it, it stays the same as initially, and it's the minimum possible uh, product of quadratures. So the Heisenberg uh, uncertainty relation is not violated, of course. Uh, the, the product of these quadratures can be larger, but if the system is good, clean, pure, uh, you don't have additional increase in the uncertainty. Um, the same system can be analyzed from the viewpoint of seeding. So you can have a coherent state at the input, uh, like a seeded parametric down conversion. What happens? This simple picture gives a uh, straightforward an explanation. So this is a coherent state. We have to follow these lines. So each point of the coherent state goes along the same hyperbolas, and we come uh, to a, an ellipse with the uh, P quadrature again squeezed and the Q quadrature against, uh, again uh, anti-squeezed uh, with the same relations more or less holding true. Um, and then also it's interesting to consider parametric amplification. We can see that depending on the phase, the initial phase of this state, the state can be amplified or deamplified. Again, I consider a coherent state with this phase. The, the phase is, is actually the angle of this. Uh, yeah, the angle formed by, uh, it's not shown here, but it's clear, yeah? what is the state on the phase plane. Uh, and uh, as uh, the state um, follows the hyperbolas, you see that it goes, uh, it becomes more uh, further from the origin and also it gets squeezed. So it gets squeezed and amplified at the same time uh, but at, at a different phase, if it enters with a different phase, it will be deamplified. Mm -hmm. there, there is an interesting point that uh, there are two uh, effects taking place simultaneously, both uh, approaching the origin and then there is this spreading. So ultimately, uh, when, when, when you very strongly uh, deamplify a state, it, starts to, it should start amplifying again due, due, due to this uh, squeezed vacuum forming because the, the, the intensity of this state, the energy of this state doesn't go to zero because it will, be, it will be becoming close to squeezed vacuum. I think that's an interesting point. Okay, so this is called phase sensitive amplification. It has interesting features, but I will not discuss it. Um, Another way to obtain a squeezed coherent state or a state that is squeezed and also displaced from the origin in, co in contrast to squeezed vacuum is uh, shown here. So if I have a squeezed vacuum and I want to turn it into a squeezed coherent state, I should use a beam splitter, but a, a very interesting beam splitter that is very asymmetric. So the transmission of this beam splitter should be almost one and the reflection should be very small. Uh, and so all my squeezed vacuum goes 
practically through the beam splitter. This is important because the squeezing, uh, the quadrature squeezing, and in fact any kind of squeezing is very sensitive to losses. Uh, so if, if, if the beam splitter were 50-50 or even, even uh, absorbing more, uh, sorry, reflecting this uh, mode more, uh, the squeezing would be considerably lost, but if it is uh, nearly transmitting, then, then it's okay. And then from the other port, I add a coherent state. Uh, I, I, it's drawn like this, but in fact, what, is, what, what one uses, usually makes is uh, making this coherent state much stronger uh, than the uh, squeezed vacuum state. So this stick uh, is shown too small. It should be much larger. And then what happens if it's known that uh, if two fields, uh, if some field is overlapped on a beam splitter with a coherent field, uh, what happens is that on the phase space, the state is just displaced. Uh, it, can be it can be proved uh, strictly theoretically in terms of the Wigner function, but uh, here I'm just showing pictures. So the squeezed vacuum will be displaced along the coherent state and nearly uh, preserved in the fault number and squeezing. Uh, why it is important to move this squeezed vacuum in, in this way? In principle, we could move it in, in all, diff on all possible ways. So the phase between uh, the, phase between the uh, coherent state and the squeezed vacuum uh, should be fixed. Yes? So it should be moved in such a way that it becomes amplitude squeezed. So this is the amplitude, and you see that the uncertainty is, uh, in the, uh, is reduced, namely in the amplitude. And why is it good? Because it's easy to detect. Because you can send this state to a detector. So this state is sent to a detector, for instance, a pin diode. And the pin diode gives, provides the photoelectric current. And this photoelectric current, if the detector is good, uh, what happens is that nearly every photon becomes an electron. So it releases an electron in the, in the pin diode. And these electrons then will show some uh, reduced amplitude fluctuations. It will look like this. So uh, if you look at current versus time, for instance, because time is the only variable you can change. If you could change space, you could probably change. It would be different. But uh, in practice, one changes time. So in time, you see some noise signal normally. I'm not saying this is zero, so I'm not saying what is the amplitude of this noise, but you see some noise of photocurrent. So if you send an amplitude squeezed light, the noise will be reduced. So with the same mean value, the noise will be reduced. And uh, this tells you that the light was amplitude squeezed. And this is, in fact, how uh, squeezed light can be detected, one of the ways to detect squeezed light. OK. And now I will a little bit revisit what Gerd Lewis was speaking about yesterday. Um, in fact, he derived the effect, I think, completely in much detail. I will not do it, but I will, I will show how it agrees with this simple picture. Uh, so the Hamiltonian is the same as for four-wave mixing. And uh, here we need polarization, expansion over field, and we will take the uh, third term in this expansion. So we need cubic nonlinearity. So as I, as I said yesterday, this leads to the same effect, creation of pairs. In principle, this Hamiltonian can be, can be considered as a Hamiltonian creating pairs. But how does it happen? The state, the input state is a coherent state. And it evolves, exactly as explained yesterday. And exactly as explained yesterday, there is a care effect. So the refractive index depends on the intensity. But because the phase of the, uh, of the, of the state, of the input state, uh, is a wave vector times z, times coordinate, or times length in the fiber, uh, we have this dependence of the uh, phase on the intensity. And I will not analyze it. It was yesterday analyzed in detail. Uh, but it so happens that high intensity part uh, gets more phase uh, than the low intensity part. And then with time, it happens so that uh, the quadrature squeezing appears. But this is quadrature squeezing in some strange quadrature. It's not amplitude. From this model, it, it is clear that, um, that the amplitude uh, is, is not squeezed. So in this direction, along the um, amplitude, uh, there is no squeezing. 
and the squeezing appears along some strange quadrature. So the question is how to detect this squeezing. Um, it is also important that the sidebands, uh, so we, we, we can speak about the photon pairs created at some frequency sidebands. But where are these sidebands? Be be because uh, in, in this soliton regime, the sidebands are actually within the, uh, within the pump uh, spectrum. So you cannot separate them spectrally, these sidebands. I can say that if you go to higher intensities, and we observe this now in, uh, hollow, in uh, hollow core fibers, in Kagome fibers exactly, like discussed yesterday and today, at higher pumps, pumping, uh, the sidebands separate visibly, and you can see, and you, you can measure um, twin beam squeezing between them, but I will not discuss it. Uh, but, but here you cannot separate. And so the carrier, so the pump, the strong coherent component, is basically spectrally indistinguishable from the sideband. Uh, so what, what should one do in this case? Uh, and among other ways, one way would be to overlap it with a coherent beam on a beam splitter, as, as a little bit discussed. You, you can guess that using some proper beam with a proper phase, you can obtain uh, quadrature squeezing, squeezing of the amplitude, for instance. But there is another way, is to turn it into twin beam squeezing. And twin beam squeezing is something that has to be still introduced. So I haven't discussed it yet. So now I will pass to twin beam squeezing. I am showing a picture very similar to what Andrius was uh, showing today. But this is nothing of the kind, this is not seeded. But this is, uh, I will explain later what it is. Uh, this is unseeded PDC. Okay, so what is twin beam squeezing? We should consider non-degenerate parametric down conversion. We should have some degeneracy between, uh, some, some lifting of the degeneracy between signal and dialer. So they should be um, of different color or of a different angle or of different polarization so that I can introduce four operators, A, A dagger for signal mode and B, B dagger for the idler mode. And as discussed in detail yesterday, the Hamiltonian will, will look like this. So it's, it's, uh, uh, it has two creation operators and two different creation operators. The Heisenberg equations, according to what I wrote yesterday, uh, are here and you get them similar. So for A and B modes for signal and dialer beams, you have exactly the same Heisenberg equations. Uh, so, in principle, it's, it's enough to solve everything for A and then to say, okay, for B it will be the same. And then let's do it. And now I would like to point out that yesterday I cheated you a little bit. So I, I did this calculation. I cheated you and actually I didn't cheat you deliberately. I made a mistake and you didn't notice. <laughs> so, so the point is now, now it is shown how exactly this uh, calculation should be done. So we have uh, an equation where in the right hand part uh, th there are Hermitian conjugated operators. So if we introduce the operators S and D, which are sum and difference of A and B operators, then we get for these operators equations with the uh, Hermitian conjugation in the right hand part. Yeah? The S over DT is gamma S dagger. And for D, you get the same but with a minus sign. And from here I came to some to wrong equations yesterday. But here it's I did it only on the blackboard, so what is, what is uh, saved on the side uh, of the conference is, uh, is okay. So here I show you how to correctly solve these equations. Mm, it's, it's easy because uh, a few slides ago, I showed you that, uh, that this equation actually was, is the same that uh, we had for the photon creation operator in the case of a degenerate chromatic <coughs> amplifier. So we had dA over dt equals to gamma A dagger. There was this equation. And, and to, to solve this equation, I passed to quadratures. Yeah, you have to pass to real and imaginary parts, and then for quadratures you get these hyper, hyperbolas and so on. But the solutions were already known, and the solutions looked like here. So A was U 
a not plus d a not dagger, and this is called Bogolubov. Yeah, why you? Yeah. I know how to write it in Russian. <laughs> so this is called Bogolubov transformation. It's a very important equation because it's used not only in quantum optics. In quantum optics, it's used for describing parametric amplification. But maybe, maybe you don't know that also for, to, for describing superconductivity uh, one, and Cooper pairs, one uses the same uh, mathematics, uh, the same Bogolubov. Uh, OK, uh, so uh, we, we already know what will be the equation for S from what we did with a uh, single mode parametric amplifier. And for the D, it will be the same, but uh, we have this minus here. So the V term um, and U and V are, uh, I'm just reminding, co uh, hyperbolic cosine and sine of G. And G is the parametric gain again. Uh, so here we have to, to put the minus because V is uh, sort, of, sort of negative in this case. It's like uh, V having a different side. Uh, sign. So after we have the r solutions for S and D, we immediately pass to A and V. And as I said, uh, I'm not going to do it for B because uh, B and D are symmetric. So for A, uh, I calculate, and it's very straightforward. Uh, so I have that A is given by the uh, other transformation, U A naught plus V B naught dagger. So now you see that A is coupled to B dagger, and B by symmetry will be coupled to a dagger. And these are called two mode Bogolubov transformations. OK, so uh, with these transformations that I repeat here, we can calculate um, all, as I said, all measurable quantities. Like you can calculate mean photon number, variance of the photon number, uh, any moment of the photon number, and, and so on, quadratures. So let's, let's continue. Uh, Mean photon number. This is a trivial calculation because we did it just just recently. The transformations for A and B look exactly the same, uh, so it's easy to calculate just mean photon number for and for for the A mode. This is an A and this is A dagger A. So I plug these transformations into the mean value, and again I have four terms. And as I said already several times, three terms go to zero because they have normally ordered vacuum operators or um, here, like here, or you have, um, you have an, a daggered operator standing in front or you have a non-daggered operator standing in the end. And then we are left with this term. So we see that the photon number in mode A is again hyperbolic sign of the gain and it's the same, exactly the same as um, what number in mode B? Yeah, it's not very impressive yet. So I, I did a lot of algebra to, to show you some trivial thing. It's, it's not difficult to make photon numbers equal. You, you can do it with a beam splitter, right? But uh, what I'm going to show is much more interesting, is that the fact, the fact that not only photon numbers are, um, mean values of the photon numbers are the same, but uh, their fluctuations are uh, completely synchronous. So if you have a certain number instantaneously in one beam, you have exactly the, the same photon number in the other beam. So how uh, can it go? So fluctuations of photon numbers. To describe fluctuations, let's calculate this value, the variance of the photon number difference. So this is important. Mm, if the photon numbers are always identically the same, then the variance of their difference will be also zero. And this is already a non-trivial non fact. And for this, I will use the blackboard. So please do not sleep for a while. Uh, I, I, I will now calculate this thing on the blackboard. So um, beca because the mean values are the same, the variance is, is given by just this uh, second moment. So uh, square of the difference, mean value, you get these three terms. And again, to simplify my task, I know that for B and A, everything will be the same. So I will calculate only this term and this term and show that they will be equal, and then I will be happy. So using these uh, Bogolubov transformations, what is n A squared mean value? I have to write four terms here. So A first 
first n a. It's a dagger a, a dagger a, this term. And then I will plug the expressions for a and a dagger. So it's u a naught dagger plus v a naught, u a uh, naught plus v a naught dagger, u, and then repeat the same, u a naught dagger plus v a naught, and then u a naught plus v a naught dagger. And immediately I see that this first term vanishes because it's a dagger operator standing in front. And for the same reason, this term vanishes. And this V, I can drag outside of the bracket. So I will get V square. And then the first bracket gives me, so I just add, uh, ah, you noticed, you noticed an error, yeah. Right. Is it correct now? Actually, it's very good to make mistakes. People do not sleep because as soon as there is a mistake, at least in Germany, it, it creates some excitement. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so it's B now, yeah? Everywhere B. Uh, so I get here U. Um, B naught, A naught, or I can write A naught, B naught. Does it matter? No, it doesn't. Because the, the important thing of these Bogolubov transformations is that they um, <coughs> maintain the commutation relations. You can check that if, yeah. So U, U um, A naught, B naught, plus V, and here it's important. I first put B and then B naught dagger. B naught, B naught dagger, that's the first term, and the second term, is u, u, a not dagger, b not dagger, plus v, uh, b not, b not dagger. Okay, life gets easier a little bit. And now we have to um, take into account that only pairwise, uh, I, can, I can only write terms that will be non-zero uh, here. This term will be non-zero, the product of this term and this term, and the product of this term and this term will be also non-zero. Concerning, for instance, this product, it will have, um, it will be zero for the reason that it has a lonely dagger operator that I can drag in front and it will act on the vacuum on the left. And then uh, this term, if, if I multiply this by this, it will have a lonely A naught operator. And again, I will, so, okay. So all terms that we are left with are v squared times the first um, term gives us u squared a naught a naught dagger b naught b naught dagger and the second term is v squared b naught b naught dagger b naught b naught dagger and I hope I didn't make a mistake. I have to check if I didn't make a mistake. Ah, it's difficult to check. Okay. But let's continue. I think I didn't. At least you, you, you watched, right? I think I will not get that result. <laughs> um, so here it's simple because, um, because I can do averaging separately. These are vacuum operators. They do not know anything of each other and I can do averaging separately. And in each case, I can write one plus A naught dagger A naught and this will be normally ordered uh, part will go to zero. So this is basically one. So this is V squared and then U squared uh, times one. Plus, this term is a little bit more difficult. And I keep thinking whether I made a mistake or not. But you, you watched. You, yeah, just <laughs> everything's fair. So here I will do 
v squared, and, and here I will use the um, commutation relations, or, yeah, I can, for instance, write it like this. The first part I will write like one plus b naught dagger b naught, and the second expression again, one plus b naught dagger b naught, right? And this part will go to zero. Ah, I forgot to break it. This part will go to the zero, right? Because, because the dagger operator stands first. And this part will go to, to zero as well because the, uh, the last one is not dagger. So, hooray, I think I got the correct result. It's v squared times u squared plus v squared. Okay. My next step is to calculate the second term, sorry, the third term. The second will be the same as this one, by symmetry, but the third term not. So I will do the same calculation. And here I want to, to write an A and B mean value. And here, right? Okay. Again, I plug Bogolubov there. So it's U A naught dagger plus V V naught. U A naught plus V B naught dagger. And then the same for B, U, B, not dagger plus V, A, not, U, B, not plus V, A, not dagger. I hope I didn't make that mistake. Maybe I made some other mistake. So I, again, I cross out uh, all uh, zero terms. And again, the V comes out, V square. And I'm left with constructions like u a naught b naught plus v b naught b naught dagger. And from the second bracket, I get u b naught dagger a naught dagger plus v a naught a naught dagger. And again, I notice that only two terms will be left. So this will be term number one and term number two. Uh, and again, for instance, the product of these two will be zero because there is, uh, ah, will it, uh, da, 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 da. no, no, I mean, I mean the, term, uh, the product of these two, yeah, will be, will be zero because there is a lonely A naught, yeah? So, okay. I write these two terms, and I will, I will get, from the first term, I will get u squared, and it's the same as last time, u squared uh, plus, and from the second term, I get v squared uh, b naught b naught dagger, a naught a naught dagger. But you see that here I will write, I will do the same trick. So I will write it one plus B naught dagger B naught. And, and this uh, part will give zero and the same I do with the second term. So I, I'm, I'm left with the same combination as the, so I calculated the third term without a factor of two and the first term and they were equal. Uh, yeah, it's just the same calculation. So I get that the variance of the difference photon number is zero. And this is a remarkable fact. I will explain why. Uh, so in principle, it's clear why, why I got this result. Because I, I just said that the photons are born always in pairs, uh, that the same numbers of photons go to S and I modes. And uh, so what's, what's the, why should I be surprised that the variance is, is of the difference is equal to zero? The surprise comes from the fact that it's uh, difficult to get it classically. It's difficult to get it by just, for instance, splitting a beam on a beam splitter. It's, uh, it takes some efforts to, to achieve this result. 
Okay, so this is very unusual because if you split a coherent beam on a beam splitter, for instance, you can easily have that mean numbers after the beam splitter are the same. But the variance of the difference will be always uh, for, for a coherent beam split on a 50-50 beam splitter, or even, no, on a 50-50 beam splitter, will be equal to the, to the mean value of the sum. And this is called short noise. And why it is called short noise, it's probably interesting to explain. Huh? Yeah. Because it, it, it's actually the signature of light consisting of photons. It's a discrete thing because it comes from the Poissonian distribution. From if you if you count some objects, you you, you have a Poisson, some objects that are appear, for instance, uh, independently of each other. And it's like uh, it's like, for instance, you you have some shot, and the shot, is, as far as I understand, is the stuff that people people used to kill birds, right? So when you shoot with this, or when when this shot was produced, it was dropping some liquid metal into water. Well, maybe, maybe uh, if I'm not correct, please correct me. And uh, the noise uh, that, that can be heard, uh, it, it, it created this, uh, this actually uh, term, short noise. So it's like, uh, like, like shots. And the same analogy is when you hear, for instance, rain um, f falling on, on a surface and you hear some discreteness in this noise. So this is the, the noise comes from the discreteness of the photon flux. Uh, and for Poissonian distribution, you have variance of uh, number of some discrete things like photons equal to the mean. And this is exactly what happens here. So this is uh, Poissonian noise, which is the minimum noise you can have with a classical source. That's why, uh, yeah, this is just another proof that light, light consists of photons. <laughs> by the way. Uh, so probably so, some other, some other um, speculation on this subject. Why noise below short noise is non-classical? So we, whenever you get the variance of the difference, whenever it's below the sum of the mean values, it's non-classical. Because uh, if, if we assume that, for instance, from some source, we have equal photon numbers into two modes, two directions. So we assume that the mean numbers of uh, uh, here are, are, are equal and given by some n. Uh, then it's easy to calculate. I will not uh, show it on the blackboard, but it's really easy to calculate that the variance of the difference of photon numbers is given by this expression, expression twice the mean number in each mode plus the quadratic term. And then with this quadratic term uh, comes the combination of uh, Glauber's correlation functions that I, uh, I wrote uh, yesterday, uh, fully uh, rigorously determined in terms of uh, normally ordered operators. So you, you have uh, the sum of autocorrelation functions, G2 signal signal, G2 idler idler, minus uh, twice the cross correlation function. And you see, whenever the variance of the uh, difference is below the, uh, the, the mean sum, uh, it means that this expression is negative. However, there is a cauchy schwarz inequality. Well, there are a lot of cauchy schwarz inequalities, but one of them uh, reads like this, that namely that the sum of uh, autocorrelation second order uh, functions minus twice the cross correlation function should be positive. Uh, so if this is below the mean value of the sum uh, of the photons, then uh, the cauchy schwarz inequality is violated. And because of this, it's very convenient to introduce a measure of this non-classicality, uh, which is the ratio of the variance of the difference photon number to the mean sum photon number, to the total mean photon number. And for this noise reduction factor, we have simple rules that for classical sources, it's always above unity, according to this inequality. And then for squeezed vacuum, we got the result that it is zero. So it's always quite exciting to, to have it below unity, and especially considerably below unity. Okay. And now I can revisit the care squeezing in fibers. I want to explain how to measure the squeezing by turning into a twin beam squeezing. 
and the trick was designed in Max Planck Institute uh, 10 years ago already. So the trick was to use polarization maintaining fiber and to have uh, quadrature squeezing uh, s simultaneously in the horizontal polarization mode and the vertical polarization mode. So wh what is a polarization maintaining fiber? Is that transmits vertically polarized light separately, horizontally polarized separately without crosstalk. They do not, they do not uh, couple to each other. And so if you have squeezing uh, separately for each mode but coherent from the same, from the same pump, you can Mm, so, for instance, for H polarization, you have this kind of squeezing, this quadrature, and for the V polarized mode, you have this quadrature. These quadratures are orthogonal. Suppose, suppose that you, you have squeezing in orthogonal quadrature. It turns out that as a result, you can have polarization squeezed light, and polarization squeezed light means that you have uh, photon correlations between two polarizations, between horizontal and vertical, that you, you have the same photon number in, in horizontal and vertical polarization modes. How to explain it? Maybe, maybe I should just, just give a hint why it happens. So, suppose that you have two single mode squeezers. What I just described before, it means that the Hamiltonian for one mode is, and for instance, the first mode is H polarized. So it looks, I will just, yeah, I, H, gamma, that's my notation, and here I will write A, H, dagger, squared. So this is a single mode squeezing Hamiltonian. So you have a quadrature squeezing for one mode, plus Hermitian conjugate. Yeah? And then for the second mode, which is vertically polarized, suppose you have and for instance you have gamma prime AV dagger squared plus HC. And I have both these Hamiltonians and they sum up. So the total Hamiltonian is H1 plus H2. And for instance, I want to make gamma prime just equal to the gamma, but with a different sign, uh, to, to be minus gamma. So I will get right? So I will have a combination. And this combination can be written as a h dagger minus a v dagger. A H dagger plus A V dagger. And from this you can, maybe if you know a little bit of polarization optics, you can guess that this corresponds to diagonally polarized light. So this is with some coefficient. So this is A 45 dagger and this is A minus 45 dagger. So from the Hamiltonian that was a sum of two Hamiltonians. We came to, to, to the Hamiltonian that contains the product of two operators. And this is basically like A dagger, B dagger, but in two other modes. So I, I hope I convinced you that having uh, single mode squeezing or quadrature squeezing in two orthogonally polarized modes, you will have some polarization squeezing, so some twin beam squeezing between uh, two uh, other orthogonally polarized mode. In this case, minus 45 degrees and plus 45 degrees polarized. This is just very simple uh, explanation, but it, I think it's correct. Okay, and it was uh, proved in an experiment. Uh, the interesting thing is that they measured variance of the difference photon number, which was of course not zero, but at least less than the sum of the mean numbers. And if you consider modes A and B to be polarization modes, then your, your difference photon number is actually the Stokes operator. Uh, I, I, wasn't, I, I wasn't going to go into these details, but uh, I didn't want to introduce polarization optics, but this is, this is so. So you have uh, polarization squeezing means the variance of a certain Stokes operator is less than the mm, mean value of the total photon number. Okay. 
And uh, finally, for this first lecture, I will describe bright squeezed vacuum. This is a real picture, by the way. This is an optical table, and this is the parametric down conversion on a screen. So the second stage is not observing it on the screen, but observing its reflection in the optical table. Uh, so what happens if we pump strongly? We just pump strongly and we can have quadrature squeezed vacuum as shown here, or we have a twin beam if uh, something is different. Either the direction is different of signal and either, or the color is different, or the polarization is different. In all these cases, again, for the number scales like hyperbolic sine square of the gain, and the gain scales linearly with a pump field, and so you can infer this gain by looking at the output, input, output dependence. So you, you change the pump power and you look at the output. And more, most precisely, this should be fitted in the logarithmic scale. And then you see that this dependence is actually an exponential dependence just in the logarithmic scale, exponentially increasing, increasing dependence. And you have this bright state, which I mentioned yesterday. Um, so what is interesting about twin beam bright, bright squeezed vacuum is that you have really large photon numbers. Here I, I, I drew maybe 10 photons. <laughs> These are photons. <laughs> but, uh, but real numbers of photons can be 10 to the 10, and they are always equal. So always the number of photons in beam A is equal to the number of photons in beam B. Uh, and interestingly, if, you, if we measure this noise reduction factor, which is the measure of non-classicality for this state, it depends on the mean photon number. It depends, um, it depends on the mean photon number in the modes for purely technical reason, because uh, you cannot uh, measure um, accurately enough to have absolutely the same modes measured in one beam and in the other. You always have some unbalancing, so there are uh, angular or frequency modes that you collect differently or the detection efficiencies are not exactly the same. In all these cases, you have that uh, noise reduction actually increases and be becomes already above short noise level when the photon number increases. But the nice thing, I think that we can have this uh, range of photon numbers where we have in classicality very broad. So in the first paper, we had it uh, about 900. Uh, in, the recent, in a recent paper, we had it about 2,000. Uh, and the, 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 the la most recent results are that we have, we have uh, squeezing up to 300 photons per mode. It's not photons per pulse, but per mode. Uh, with, uh, and, and the best noise reduction factor was achieved, achieved was 0.2. So I think, I think it's quite good. Um, and now some interesting effect that happens due to, due to this uh, extreme amplification. So just today morning, Andrew said that uh, walk-off is detrimental and it's, very, it's, it's always bad. So now I want to show you how sometimes it's very good. So uh, this is uh, what happens if you have really strong uh, parametric amplification in a long crystal with focused pump. So exactly the case that was discussed. And, uh, it, it's clear that because amplification occurs only along the pump, preferable emission will be only in the direction of the pointing vector in the crystal. So what is shown is the pump, and inside, uh, inside the crystal, the energy of the pump propagates not along the k-vector. The k-vector is outside of the crystal, uh, the same as pointing vector, but inside, mm, it's tilted. And the amplification will be along this pointing vector because, because to be amplified, uh, the, the, the radiation needs the pump. And what we, what we see in this case is this uh, parametric rings and a strange beam coming out. And uh, it, it looks blue or white only because the camera we used was saturated. So when we put a neutral density filter, we clearly saw that uh, the, the central red part of the rings is hardly seen, but it's clear, clear that the beam is green. Uh, and, and this is not even the radiation that goes along the pointing vector, but it's the twin beam because the radiation that goes along the pointing vector in this case is in the infrared range and we do, don't see it. But this beam is very strong and the same and has the same photon number as the, the other beam, which still has to be checked. We haven't checked it, but uh, theoretically it should be. Uh, but already we're using this source and uh, maybe you, you, you've seen the poster by Andrea Cavanna. 
uh, we use this source as a mirrorless optical parametric oscillator. So uh, what happens, we have tremendous generation along this pointing vector uh, in the idler beam, and we use this idler beam, but also we have a copy, it's copy in the signal beam in the visible range. Uh, these are the features of this source. Uh, it's tunable in wavelengths, so when we tilt the crystal, the direction of the walk-off changes very little, so the beam stays almost the same, uh, but the color changes, so the, the wavelength changes. Uh, then we can make it single mode spatially because it just goes, as you saw, uh, instead of the ring, we have just a blob, just, just a beam, and we can make this beam round with some tricks. Uh, so this is single mode spatially, this we checked. This is bright, so for instance, we from 50 milliwatt pumping, uh, at 355, we have uh, about few few milliwatt, and at 1600. Uh, then it has thermal statistics. It's one of the twin beams, and I think I explained yesterday, or maybe I didn't, that one, uh, that if you take just one of the two beams, it will have G2 equal to two, uh, and G3 equal to six. So it's a uh, n factorial uh, dependence on n, and so it's efficient for nonlinear optical interactions, and. Also, very nice is that the twin beam we can keep as a copy. We, we will know exactly what, what's the intensity and, and better than short noise, hopefully. Uh, so th these are, for instance, uh, the third harmonic, uh, pictures of third harmonic created in a uh, photonic crystal fiber, not even phase matched, uh, using this source. So it's quite, quite bright. And now we'll make a break. So the whole story of entanglement started there, although the term was, was actually coined by Schrodinger in German. Uh, but the argument is about whether probability is a, um, a quality of a single, probabilistic behavior is a quality of a single particle or a quality of the whole ensemble. Uh, and it was the... Um, the subject of discussion between Einstein and Bohr, as it's very well known. Uh, so a quantum particle we describe with some parameters, uh, coordinate, momentum, for instance, or polarization in the case of photon or spin, and so on. So do these variables, do these parameters exist immediately when the, the particle is created or, or not? And uh, so Einstein's viewpoint was that yes, they exist, uh, but because we deal with many particles only, we cannot measure a single one, we, 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 never, we can never say. And actually, now it's not the case, because now we learn to deal with single particles, uh, single atoms, ions, and, and so on. Uh, Bohr, on the contrary, Bohr's opinion was that even a single particle is always probabilistic, so like dice. So a, a photon can be considered as a die before it's thrown. We don't know the outcome before we do the measurement. And the interesting thing is that quantum optics enables the test. Uh, so during this discussion, there was a paper on, uh, by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, and they considered uh, a source emitting correlated particles. Now, later we uh, started, now we call these particles entangled, but suppose they said uh, two particles are born with exactly uh, correlated coordinates and momentums. Uh, so there was a lot of reasoning on this, uh, but in, in fact this situation is described by the uh, total wave function being not the product of the single particle wave function. Uh, yeah, state vectors, here I wrote actually state vectors. All this situation was also discussed in uh, Bob Boyd's lecture, so I will I will try not to uh, dwell on it too much, but some slides I do have. <laughs> so as I, as I said yesterday, a photon pair created through parametric down conversion has certain correlations in uh, coordinate and momentum. The coordinate is the coordinate uh, after the crystal, of, as was correctly mentioned yesterday. Uh, and the momentum is related to the angle of emission. So each photon can be emitted at a, 
at any angle, more or less, but its twin will be only whenever we, we register a single photon uh, emitted at a certain angle, its twin will be emitted, uh, will be found uh, at a correlated angle. And the entanglement is in the fact that uh, the spread, the total spread of the angular uh, emission is large and the correlation spread, the, the width of the correlation is smaller. And this is, as, as I show uh, further, this can be used as a measure of entanglement, the, the ratio of the two. So it's, it's that one subsystem taken separately, one photon is uncertain, but the two systems are correlated. Um, and this is exactly the situation that uh, was considered by uh, EPR. So the angle is, uh, I think I'm, I'm now confusing you because uh, I, I return to my yesterday's notation where Q was denoting the transverse wave vector uh, or transverse momentum. So the angle is the ratio and uh, anyway. So there is a correlation in transverse wave vector and also correlation in the coordinates. So Q, X, are now coordinates and Q are transverse momentums. Mm, and as I said yesterday, you can, uh, you can represent two photon amplitude, uh, this term was introduced yesterday, uh, as a probability of the emission into modes uh, with, into plane waves with such transverse uh, wave vector. Or alternatively, you can use the coordinate re representation and you can speak of the probability amplitude that one photon is uh, found at coordinate X and the other at coordinate I. And uh, typically, one can measure in experiment the um, distributions of, of this uh, angle uh, or wave vector and coordinate. So this distribution where in principle you can find the photon is called unconditional, unconditional width and uh, like this, and this is a conditional width. So if you find the signal photon, for instance, at this angle or transverse wave vector, you find its twin within a very narrow uh, bandwidth. And because as I said yesterday that the two things are Fourier transforms of each other, two dimensional Fourier transforms, it's clear, well, this, this equation, these equations are prob probably difficult to understand, but I take into account that this uh, dimension is Fourier related to um, is Fourier related to uh, this dimension, and um, this dimension is Fourier related to this dimension, and from this I I, I get these relations. A factor of two appears bec because the conditional and unconditional width is d defined in a uh, in, in an operational way. So from the viewpoint of an experimentalist who measures the distribution of a photon. In, um, angle or coordinate, and then uh, one can one can speak about the uncertainties of the sum of the uh, wave vectors and of the difference of the coordinates, and related to to these uh, conditional widths. And then from this we we come to the statement that the product, oops, the product of the uncertainties in the sum of the uh, wave vectors and in the difference of the coordinates, uh, th this product is, is exactly equal to the ratio of the conditional width and unconditional width, both in coordinate, uh, in momentum and coordinate, both in wave vector and coordinate. And from the lecture of uh, Bob Boyd, you know that this is the value that usually is measured uh, in, in works characterizing uh, entanglement. <laughs> Maybe it's too complicated, too complicated slide, but maybe you can ask questions later. Uh, this measure, this ratio of the conditional and unconditional width is called Fedorov ratio, so the, the inverse is called the Fedorov ratio, and the more this number is, the more the state is entangled in, in, in this parameter. Okay, the same happens in frequency, as I showed yesterday, if you have signal and idler beam occupying, uh, I, I showed some slightly different uh, pictures, but the meaning is the same. So if the signal uh, photon is found within si some band and the idler photon is found within some other band, for instance, delta lambda idler, so this is the unconditional uh, width of the distribution of the idler photon, but uh, whenever you fix 
uh, the wavelength of the signal photon, you will find the idler photon within uh, a much narrower bandwidth, and the ratio of the two, again, uh, gives the degree of entanglement. So w whenever it's much larger than one, you, you, you have highly entangled system. Uh, and this is just, just to mention that also this type of entanglement, this is exactly EPR entanglement. This is exactly what, what Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen spoke about, this system. So the system you can have if you have uh, quadrature squeezed beams, uh, two beams, uh, coming to different ports of a beam splitter. And then at the output, and this is a 50-50 beam splitter, so of course you lose some of squeezing, but you get, uh, you get some interesting entanglement between the two beams. Uh, so eventually, if you denote Q large uh, and P large, the output quadratures after the beam splitter, then you have this equation, and this is also a measure of entanglement, the sum of variances in two, in, in again, in the sum of coordinates and in the uh, difference of momentum. So these are now momentums and coordinates uh, quadratures. Okay. Um, and now I would like to speak about Bell's inequality. Bell's inequality is something that is related to entanglement, but not in one-to-one -one correspondence. So you can have entanglement in the system, but no violation of Bell's inequality. Uh, maybe some, some do not understand why I'm showing socks. It's not just to wake you up. But, but there is a famous example of uh, some socks of different, you have two pair of socks, and for instance, two red ones and two blue ones. Then you, you put them pairwise in the, in the two boxes and send one box to Alice and the other one to, to Bob. And so if, if uh, sorry, what, 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 so if Alice gets a, a sock of certain color, she immediately learns that Bob has uh, the sock of a, either the same color or the different color according to the commitment. But, <laughs> but uh, in no way this system, this, this is correlations. This is an example of correlation. Right. So, or, or if you, uh, anyway, so there are other examples. So these correlations are at first sight similar to the correlations. Like I say, first photon is red, uh, the other photon will be also red. First photon is orange, the other one is twin will be also orange, or the, or, or the other way around. But the photon correlations, in principle, can violate Bell's inequality, and these correlations, the SOC correlations, do not violate Bell's inequality. And now I'm going to speak about Bell's inequality violation. So, from EPR paradox to come to Bell's inequality violation, there was a trick made. And this trick is binary representation. So to, to distinguish uh, not qualitatively but quantitatively between Einstein's viewpoint and Bohr's viewpoint, so does a single particle behave probabilistically or is it just a, a feature of the ensemble, uh, some trick was needed. And this trick was um, representing a, f a photon or at first, it was done. It was done actually not with photons, but with other particles, uh, as a coin with two outcomes. Uh, so you you toss a co coin. You have you have heads or tails, and uh, you you can attribute some binary uh, some binary value um, or dichotomic value to this. So you toss a coin, and the first example uh, that allows to uh, put into correspondence to a coin, a quantum particle is a spin one-half particle. So the uh, well-known Stern-Gerlach experiment, if a particle with spin one-half is transmitted through a magnet, uh, then uh, depending on the projection of the spin one-half on the direction of the magnetic field, it goes up or down. So this is a typical dichotomic measurement. So uh, tossing a coin, you have only two outcomes. And the nice thing is that photons uh, can behave like this. So it's, it was done. Uh, Bell's inequalities have been checked with non-photons, with other particles. But only with photons, I think it, it, it is done really easy and uh, with, with high accuracy. So a photon is similar to this Stern-Gerlach particle because uh, if you have a polarized photon, then depending on the polarization, it will be transmitted through a polarizing beam splitter or reflected. And uh, depending on this, you can say, uh, so the, the polarization was either this or that. Uh, and 
fortunately, we can make such photons using parametric down conversion. We, we can make photons that are uh, entangled in this call, in these properties. So they have correlated pol polarizations. So uh, we can prepare a state where uh, whenever photon in one beam is polarized uh, vertically, its twin is polarized horizontally. So one passes through such prism and the other is reflected. Yeah? Um, so how to derive, first of all, how to derive Bell's inequality? I will show this derivation because it's very simple. It's really simple. I don't even need a blackboard to, to show it. And it's strikingly convincing, but it is wrong. So the Bell inequality is wrong. <laughs> okay, so first we have to introduce some variables. And these will be features of the particles, the, these hidden variables that Einstein was, was thinking about. So a, a single particle in tr already after its emission has some variables. Like for instance, projection, that like the spin is up or down. Or if it is a photon, it's initially polarized vertically or horizontally or circularly and so on. So we consider photons and we'll put a beam splitter and whenever the photon is transmitted and this detector clicks, we say, okay, variable A is plus one. If the photon is reflected and this detector clicks, we say, okay, variable A is minus one. So this is the measurement of variable A. But we can also introduce such variables for photon B and we say that B variable is plus one or minus one. Okay. Further, we want another pair of variables. Also, we want variables that take two values, plus one and minus one. The way we introduce these variables is very trivial. We just tilt the beam splitter at some angle, for instance, 45 degrees. And with the tilted beam splitter, I, I didn't um, try to draw the tilted beam splitter, but you can believe that I can tilt this beam splitter and these detectors will also click. So whenever this detector clicks, uh, we say, a prime is one, so this is a variable A prime. And whenever this detector clicks, is A prime is minus one. And similarly for photon B. And now, just some mathematics, very simple trick. We uh, make a combination of these variables. A B plus A prime B plus A B prime minus A prime B prime. And we notice that this is also dichotomic, so it takes values only plus two or minus two. How we can notice it? We just it's, uh, I could write on the blackboard, but it is shown on the other slide. We can, uh, we can represent this value as, um, um, is, it, is it clear that maybe it's, it's easy to see both? So I can, I can write S is A, B plus B prime plus A dagger, A, A prime, B minus B prime. Right? And so you, you look at these terms. So because the, the, the parameter B is dichotomic, either B equals B prime or B equals to minus B prime. In the first case, if B equals B prime, we have zero here, but uh, two or minus two here. Uh, and A only takes values one and minus one. So we have S equal to two or minus two. Now, if B equals to minus B prime, then this term vanishes, and this term takes values two or minus two. And A, takes, A, A prime takes values plus or minus uh, one. So we again have S equals to plus minus two. Well, sometimes it, it's introduced with one half, but it's, it's the same. So I hope I convinced you that this simple mathematics works, and S takes only values plus and minus two. And, and now something that every experimentalist can understand, but maybe <laughs> even also a theoretician. So uh, if you have this value that takes only two and minus two values, and suppose you measure this value, you have two, two, sometimes minus two, two, minus two, two. What do you have if you average this value? Obviously, you cannot have anything above two or below two, right? I think it's very clear that you have the value um, the absolute value between these two. So you, you have the absolute value less than two, right? Mathematically, it can be introduced like this. Uh, we have to assume that there are some intrinsic parameters that determine the values A, B, 
A prime, B prime, and th these are namely called um, hidden variables, these lambdas. So a set of parameters. The pho photon is created. It has color, you know, polarization, uh, belongs to some party. Uh, I don't know, many parameters. And, uh, and depending on these parameters, it's already known what values take A, A prime. And if you take this, uh, the probability of this set of parameters, and then average with this probability distribution, you will get average value uh, restricted like this. So this is mathematics. This is common sense. But both point at the same, that we have um, the value of S, uh, the mean value of S between 2 and minus 2. So unfortunately, uh, fortunately, it is wrong because quantum mechanics works, and that's why uh, some of us are paid. So, uh, and how it is, this inequality is violated. For this, you need entangled polarization, entangled photon pairs. And I didn't explain, probably I should have explained, in what exactly case you obtain such pairs. But I didn't. So you have to believe me that if I uh, put in a certain way crystals, some crystals, and uh, pump them somehow, I will have a state shown here. So this is a single photon in mode A. This is a single photon in mode B. This photon is polarized horizontally. This photon is polarized vertically. So this is uh, first part, and it's a superposition. So either uh, photon A is polarized horizontally, photon B is polarized vertically, or vice versa. And this state uh, is called, I, I shouldn't say or vice versa, because it's and vice versa, bec because there is a minus sign. It's like shedding your cat, that it's simultaneously dead and alive. <laughs> so uh, this is so-called psi minus state, one of the four Bell states. They, call, they are called this way because they violate Bell's inequality. And you see that it's, it's clear that this construction, or maybe it's not clear, but then you have to believe, cannot be represented as a product of two, two single photon uh, state vectors. And so what happens, a source emits photons into modes A and B, which could be different color, different polarization, different direction. But if you put polarizing beam splitters and do this measurement, then if the photon in beam, B, beam A is reflected, the photon in beam B is always transmitted, uh, and vice versa. And so uh, you can also put, you can also rotate these two polarizers but w w whenever you do it in, a, in the same way, or you can put some quarter wave plates that make some other transformation and uh, rotate them similarly. So you have, to, you have to perform the same transformation in both arms, and then you will still have the same result. Whenever uh, photon A is transmitted, photon B is reflected, and vice versa. So one can say that polarization of each photon is uncertain, but it is always correlated with the polarization of the other one. Um, and after this uh, dichotomic or discrete variable viewpoint was introduced, and I think it was David Bohm who did it, uh, if I'm not mistaken, then uh, experiments started, and at first they were made with uh, particles, I think not photons, uh, with massive particles, but then with photons, and the most uh, the way they are made in fo with photons is like, like I described, the source is parametric down conversion, two polarizing beam splitters, two detectors, and uh, uh, first we just put, we, we use some setting of the beam splitters, and then we use another setting of the beam splitters and measure, um, and always we measure coincidences. So we measure the joint, uh, the simultaneous numbers of photons measured in A uh, and B arms. And the settings, uh, so we measure coincidences for very particular settings of the beam splitters. So either uh, this beam splitter is at zero and this beam splitter is at 22.5 degrees, then uh, this beam splitter is at zero, this is at minus 22.5, uh, this is at 45, this is at 22.5, and the fourth uh, combination. So it's, it's not that for any uh, orientation of the beam splitter you will violate these inequalities, but these are orientations exists, and um, 
quantum mechanical calculation gives that uh, you can reach the value of two square root of two for this S, for which we, we just classically derived that the two is the bound for the absolute value. So you can exceed it by the, like, like this, exceed this value. And this is the experiment that uh, is uh, one of the most famous one by Lenaspe uh, and others. <laughs> uh, so vi violation uh, was uh, here was achieved by a nine standard deviation. I I'm afraid I cannot tell you what these values mean, but basically it's, it's a, always measuring the coincidences. So you, you, here you see the coincidence circuits. Uh, and I importantly, importantly, it was done with atoms. It was done not with parametric down conversion because uh, although in, in 81, uh, surprisingly, in 81 already not only existed the source of parametric down conversion, uh, so PDC was known, as I said, from 67, but also the fact that correlation exists what, what was also known from uh, starting from the paper of uh, 1970, but the polarization entanglement was not yet uh, developed. Uh, so experiments with PDC started in 1986, I think. Uh, Okay, and uh, I'm coming to the last part of my talk, which is macroscopic entanglement. So I showed that uh, you can have two photons entangled, you can have uh, two squeezed beams entangled, but is it possible to have really large systems to be entangled? So uh, a good example is this Schrodinger cat, which is uh, simultaneously sort of dead and alive, and it's a really big object, um, at least, for us, and uh, it's very interesting to, to look for uh, entanglement on the macroscopic level and to, for entanglement to the extent where uh, the Bell's inequalities are violated. Because as I mentioned, um, not only socks do not violate Bell's inequalities, but there are some systems that are entangled but still do not violate Bell's inequalities. Okay, so I will show that it's possible. And I will use uh, my favorite example. This is a uh, bright squeezed vacuum. So it is possible, again, with a proper combination of crystals to create a source that emits not only correlated numbers of photons in two modes, not only large numbers of photons into two modes, but also uh, in such a way that if you use this Bell uh, setup or polarization entanglement setup, so you, you, you have two beam splitters in the arms A and B, and you have also quarter wave plates, so you can have in any, in, in any of the arms, you can have any polarization uh, state filtered by this system. Uh, still, you will have exactly equal numbers of photos each time um, emitted into, transmitted here, M, and reflected here, M, or transmitted here and reflected here, N. Uh, to some extent, of course, up to losses, up to experimental imperfections, and so on. Uh, the question is how to characterize this entanglement. Uh, when I asked some theoretician what, what should I measure, he told me that sh I should measure the measure. And uh, this phrase uh, was very unclear and also very impressive. Also, it sounds very good in all languages, I think. <laughs> At least we tried German, English, and Italian, I don't know how it sounds in French, uh, but it really doesn't tell us anything. <laughs> so, so since then we, we measure the measure all the time, uh, whatever measure it is, uh, and that time we constructed a witness. What is a witness? witness is, a witness is a uh, sufficient condition. So if I observe something, then I, I say the system is entangled but it's not a necessary condition. So we derived a witness which looks like this. If there is a separable bipartite system, bipartite means that it has two parts, A and B. Um, separable means not entangled. So we assume that there is no entanglement between beams A and B. Uh, then what we can do, we can, we can prove that uh, the density matrix of this system, uh, sorry, uh, this is just the definition of the uh, separability. I think it's maybe, maybe it's too complicated, but, but this is a definition of separability that if, if a system of A and B uh, subsystems is bipartite, then its density matrix can be written as a, one says, uh, uh, 
convex sum of the direct products of the density matrices of the uh, subsystems. So P are just the probabilities to have uh, a realization like this. Uh, and then if you also assume that the total Stokes uh, operator for the whole system A and B is the sum of their Stokes operators, which is physically, uh, can be physically justified. Uh, and this happens for all Stokes operators, S0, S1, S3. Uh, then we can derive a very uh, interesting relation that looks like an uncertainty relation, that the variance, this is variance, delta S1 squared, this is variance of uh, first Stokes operator, variance of the second Stokes operator, and the third Stokes operator. It's, it's larger than twice the mean value of photons, which is the uh, zero Stokes operator. So this is sometimes understood as, 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 a very, as a universal uncertainty relation, but it's not correct. It, this follows from this assumption, and whenever this is violated, it means that the system is not separable. So this assumption is not correct. And uh, we um, ma managed to violate it, but even theoretically, <coughs> if the same photon numbers are emitted into all polarization modes, and that's the case for that state, as I, I think... I explained to you, then the variances of all uh, Stokes um, operators are identically zero for this state. And uh, we saw the violation of this inequality by uh, several, five actually standard deviation. I will not explain what is, the, what are, what is plotted on the axis. I can only say that this is uh, below this line. We see violation uh, of this separability condition. Uh, so we, we proved that the state of bright squeezed vacuum which has some polarization entanglement. But that's good, but that's not the whole story because uh, we wanted to know whether it can violate some Bell's inequality. And for me, it was a very, very nice surprise that our collaborators from Gdansk uh, managed to write an inequality which in principle should be violated. So theoretically, it should be violated. <coughs> So I will explain what is the inequality. This is the source again, and now I don't care about what is, trans what is reflected from the beam splitters. Like in a Bell, like in a Bell measurement setup, there are just two polarizers. We see what is transmitted um, here. In in mode A, for instance, n photons are transmitted at a certain setting of the polarizer, and in mode B, at another setting of the polarizer, m photons are transmitted. And now I, I, I start playing with these numbers. And if I assume, so this is the assumption of hidden variables. I assume that initially when the photons are emitted, I know the number, not I know, but there are certain photon numbers emitted into modes A and B. So someone uh, presses the button and some certain but unknown photon numbers are emitted in, in modes A and B. And only then we put here polarizers and measure and measure and what we obtain. So the, the clever thing was to introduce the, in, the, the variable uh, being the absolute value of the difference of M and N. So we take the difference of the photon numbers and we take the absolute value models. I here means setting of the polarizer, and uh, they used many settings of the polarizers, but minimum, uh, m minimum two in each arm. I will show you on the next slide. But if there are L settings of the polarizer, the inequality looks like this, uh, and it's basically a distance inequality. I can, I can show it here. So minimum, I, th th there are... Uh, one and two settings of each polarizer, two settings of each polarizer, and M1 is the number of photons you get at setting one of this polarizer, and N1 is the number that you get at setting one of this polarizer, so like this. And it, it, the, the simplest inequality can be just written from the, from the geometry. Uh, it, it's clear that N1, N2 minus M1 is smaller than uh, N1 minus M1 plus M2 minus N1 plus N2 minus M2. Uh, so this is one, one example of a dis distance inequality, like for a triangle. Uh, but but it, it requires minimum four uh, sides. Uh, and they showed that this inequality holds true. It is violated by quantum mechanics. 
But unfortunately, to observe this violation, you have to basically distinguish these photons. You have to basically distinguish three photons from four, five from six, and so on. So you, 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 you have to distinguish the photons, and you don't, and you cannot lose them. You, losses are very uh, destructive for this kind of measurement. Um, okay, and the probably last thing I want to say for today is about uh, photon number entanglement. So that was polarization entanglement, but there, there is also quite interesting that uh, just the photon numbers are always correlated. Um, I think I mentioned yesterday that even if you have low gain parametric down conversion, so if you have very seldom pairs emitted into beams A and B, then it is already a feature of an entanglement feature because the state cannot be written as a, as a product of uh, states of two uh, particles or two modes. It's, it's more correct to say that in each mode you have some state, right? In mode A you have some state, in mode B you have some, some state, and uh, the, the, the total state cannot be, is not a product. Okay, so this is weak photon number entanglement. Speaking of uh, bright squeezed vacuum, so of what is created at a high gain PDC. The state is, is also uh, represented by a, a series over a, an expansion over four states in modes A and B, but this series is uh, infinite. So these coefficients Cn, uh, they, uh, I think I will, because I have time, I will draw this. So for this expansion, I can draw how Cn behave, uh, maybe modulus. So they follow the envelope, which is uh, a geometric distribution or negative exponential. So it's decaying, uh, but of course it has only discrete values. But the higher the parametric gain, the less steep is this decay. So for low parametric gain, you have a state like this, which has basically no photons, or one photon in each mode, or very seldom two photons. But if the gain is high, you have all these terms, so a large number of terms. And this can be shown to be, uh, to, to indicate high degree of photon number entanglement. So here just, uh, I can show the result of some calculation where three parameters characterizing entanglement are plotted called negativity and Schmidt number, which I introduced yesterday, the number of Schmidt modes, but these are Schmidt modes in photon numbers, and further of ratio also in photon numbers. And you see that they all differ, it's logarithmic scale, they differ by, by some factor, uh, which is the, just the question of definition, but they all grow with a mean photon number. This is what happens when you have several modes. Um, so the growth will be not so, not so fast, but still, still the state, we see that the more entangled, the, the, the more uh, bright is the state, the more entangled it is. And finally, uh, just an, an example. So how looks the unconditional distribution over photon number? It's broad, so each subsystem has uncertainty, large uncertainty in photon numbers, but taken together, uh, it, it has correlations. So if we have beam A and beam B and, and see uh, and look at conditional distribution, so I, I choose, again, I think I will explain what I mean here. <laughs> I can introduce photon number in beam A and photon number in beam B, and this is probability distribution. Ideally, uh, all this distribution looks like this, right? So this is the envelope that I sh just showed. So this is how uh, the uh, population of each mode uh, looks, so how, how the probability distribution of a photon number looks in each mode, and this indicates that everything is in one plane. So Na is always equal to Nb. In experiment, it's, it gets broadened, of course, and when there are many modes, the distribution is shifted. So you have something like this instead of, instead of it. And if you, um, if you take the conditional, unconditional distribution, so projection on this, of this distribution on one axis, you have this 
broad distribution shown here. But if you, if you are looking at distribution of photons in mode A, uh, provided that in mode B you fix some photon number, it will be much narrower. And that's what is shown here. And this can be used in, uh, I, I'm sure it can be used in quantum information encoding, uh, but it has not been realized yet. Um, it can be used in quantum imaging. It can be used, uh, well, I don't know yet what else, but uh, definitely, definitely it's an interesting feature. And I think, I think that's all. It's not quite time, but uh, maybe you have some questions. <laughs>